and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. You know, it's getting a little bit late in the season, but we're going to talk about some things that you need to be watching for out in your soybeans and probably even doing some treating for. We're going to talk about fungicides, we're going to talk about bugs, and other things that are happening in your soybean field. We're also going to discuss some of the issues we've seen this year, everything from sidewall smearing to we've seen some carryover issues. We want to talk through some of those things, so hopefully they can be avoided next year. We've got a difficult to control weed of the week that just keeps popping up all through the season. We'll talk about how to stop it on your farm, but first, here's our farm basics. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference because only I know what it takes out here. Yields what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk about one of the most important things that a farmer can do each year, that is get his or her grain bins ready to go for fall. Well, when you're thinking about grain bins, you want to store grain for an indefinite amount of time. So it might be, well, I'm going to put it in the bin and then I'm going to sell it in a week or two. And it might be, I'm going to hold on to it for a whole year. The big thing for farmers is, Grain bins offer them that window of time where, you know what, I don't want to take it to town right now or I don't have time to take it to town right now to sell it. I'm going to wait for a better price and a better time for me to do all that work. When it's harvest time, especially where we farm, where we don't have a lot of days before the snow starts flying, once harvest begins, a lot of times it might only be a week or two. We've got to get all that crop out. So we want to go as quickly as we can. If we have our own grain bins, we can haul right to those. We don't have to wait in line at any elevator. That is an enormous deal. So the first thing, if a farmer is going to get his grain bins ready to go for fall or for harvest, any time of year that would be, is to clean them out fully. So we don't want any dirt in there. We don't want any bugs in there, obviously even to the degree that we want to sweep the bottom of the bin out, we want to sweep the sides of the bin out, we want everything perfectly clean. That's really important because you don't want to have any spot for insects or disease to carry over into the next crop that you're going to put in the bin because, as we mentioned, buying ourselves that time by having the grain in the bin, we need that grain to be in perfect quality so we can't take any chance that last year's problems become our problems now. All right, so the next thing that a farmer should do then is make sure that all the equipment in that grain bin is working properly. So everything from the auger to the vents up above, the doors, and then what I always tell people to do is just stand in the grain bin and look around a little bit. If you see light anywhere, that's a problem. Everything has to be sealed up well. So almost every single year we will seal right at the base around the outside of the grain bin just to make certain that we don't have any moisture moving in there. All that stuff has to get done right now. Well, when everything is cleaned out inside and all the equipment is functional, and when we talk about equipment, we're talking about a lot of the unloading equipment for the grain. I mean, you'd hate to put grain in a bin and then not be able to get it back out, right? Now that you've got everything clean and functional, we want to spray inside the bin for insects. And if we can put something in there, a layer of protection, so we don't have any bugs getting into our grain, uh, it really saves us some more time down the road where we don't have to worry about, hey, we've got grain that's been chewed into and could potentially develop some mold or problems. The other nice thing, if this is done now, is you can go with a mixture of, let's say, malathion and a cheap pyrethroid. It doesn't cost very much money, relatively safe to human beings. That's great. What happens a lot of times is people don't clean out the bins well, they don't spray in advance, and then they have bugs in the bin. Well, at that point, they have to use something that is extremely dangerous to human beings to kill those bugs once they're in there. All right, the other thing, too, is once we get that bin already inside, we want to get the bin ready outside. What we like to do is mow around the outside of the bin if you've got grass or spray around the outside of the bin if you've got some weeds growing right up next to it. This helps keep rodents away. And when you think about it, you fill that bin full of fresh grain, it's a smorgasbord for rodents. So we don't want to have any kind of problem where we get mice or rats 
uh, attacking that grain bin too. Well, once again, grain bin preparation is incredibly important. If you're a farmer, make sure you're following these steps. If you're a non-farmer, we just wanted you to understand how important this is. Even though you might not think about it a lot, this is a job that many farmers are doing each summer to get those grain bins ready. Well, one other thing farmers are doing is working on stopping our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? Tough, precise, efficient. Strip tillage with the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm. Learn more at SoilWarrior.com slash AgPhD. Take a look inside any rotary combine and you'll find single rotor technology. Technology Case IH introduced over 35 years ago with the Axial Flow Combine. But unless it gives you more bells and whistles with fewer belts and chains, more power using less fuel, it's not an Axial Flow. Because while the heart of every rotary combine beats red, only Case IH gives you the power to do more. At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market, surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, XPR concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today. The Guardian Air Twin Spray Nozzle from Hypro produces a twin spray pattern with air inducted droplets for superior coverage, even in dense canopies. Be effective and efficient with your spray application this season with the Guardian Air Twin. Hypro, helping you spray better. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Even though it's August, we don't want you giving up on your soybeans just yet. There is still yield to gain if you properly protect your beans from diseases, from insects. And you might consider doing things like adding a little more fertilizer out there. We're going to talk about all these late season treatments to soybeans today. First of all, with scouting. You should be out in your fields regularly throughout the season. And what are you looking for when you're scouting? Well, at this point of the year, I like to bring a sweep net with me. I head through the soybeans, I'm making some sweeps, and I'm looking for insects. And when I see problem bugs, stink bugs, Japanese beetles, uh, and other harmful insects to my crop, I'm going to start counting and looking to see, hey, how many of these do I have, how big of an issue it is. And then, when you look at the thresholds, don't get thrown off. Don't think, oh, I need to have this huge amount of one particular insect. I'm looking at the multi-bug complex. If I see, you know what, I'm halfway to the threshold on stink bugs, I'm three quarters of the way to the threshold on Japanese beetles, oh yeah, and I've also got some green clover worms, and I've also got another pest, and another pest, and another pest, you need to be spraying. You don't want to wait for one bug to reach that threshold. So when you're scouting, bugs is one of the big things that I'm looking for. Here's the other thing too, when we talk about insect thresholds, it's economic thresholds that we're after. So here's where I'm going with this. Let's say that you can control your insects with $2 worth of insecticide. Is it a big deal if you have to call the plane in? Well, of course it is, because if the plane costs $8, all of a sudden your cost is $10 versus $2 if you're already out there making a trip. So am I going to spray at a much lower threshold? Absolutely. So occasionally we'll see ridiculous nonsense out there like, oh, the soybean aphid threshold is 250 aphids no matter what. Doesn't matter your cost, doesn't matter your yield, doesn't matter the price of the bean. Come on, that's not an economic threshold. You have to change your thresholds based on all the economic factors. So what we're trying to tell you here is, if you've got a very low cost, now you need a lot fewer bugs in the field to justify that treatment. 
One other thing that I'm looking for as I'm out there scouting is I'm grabbing some plant tissue tests. I, I want to pull some leaves off these plants, send them into a lab, and see what I've got for nutrients. Now, some will say I'm looking for nutrient deficiencies. Not necessarily. I, I hope I don't see a visual deficiency, because if I do, I've already lost a whole bunch of yield. I want to find these things out before they happen. So I'm pulling plant tissue tests on a weekly basis to see, hey, where am I at for nutrients in the crop? what's going on out there. And if I see a consistent pattern that, you know what, uh, my levels on, maybe it's nitrogen, they're going down, 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 down. Maybe I need to get some nitrogen out there and stop that process. Now you're gonna figure out over a period of years if, hey, you know what, I can be down a little bit because I was extremely high there before. I don't know exactly what numbers you need to hit for the yield goals that you're at, but you do need to watch the trends out in your field. If you see that you're starting to run short, a foliar fertilizer might be a good addition to whatever you're spraying on the field. Now, as Darren says that, let's talk specifically about nitrogen real quick. First of all, foliar nitrogen is going to help a tiny little bit. If you think that you need lots of nitrogen to get to that next yield level, you're not going to be able to do it with foliar. You're going to have to put that down on the ground most likely. But I would say this, if you've got high levels of soil organic matter and you're only going for 80 bushels or less, the odds are probably pretty slim that lots of extra nitrogen is really going to help you. Now, if you have sandy soil with very low organic matter, you're going for 100 plus bushel soybeans, and let's say you've had a whole bunch of rainfall through the season to flush nitrogen out of your system, well then absolutely adding a bunch more nitrogen will likely make sense. So we just encourage you experiment with some of these different things so you learn more about what's going on in your farm. What we usually talk about when it comes to foliar fertilizer with soybeans is some of the micronutrients, whether that's boron, manganese, zinc, copper, iron, maybe even molybdenum. There are a lot of different nutrients that you may only need a tiny little bit of, and it really could boost your yield by one, two, three, four bushels, something like that. The one thing that I'm really not scouting for so much is disease out in my field. Now you may say, wait a minute, you gotta be watching to see if you have disease in your plant. If I've got disease out there, I'm probably already too late. With the fungicide options that we have on the market today, they're pretty good at preventing a disease from coming. They're not really good at stopping a full-blown disease epidemic that's already happening out in my field. So when I'm doing the fungicide applications, I'm really planning those out in advance. On our farm, for example, one problem that we've had over the years that we're always concerned about, especially on a year where we get plentiful moisture like we have in 2019, is white mold. So we're worried about white mold. We've got a plan in place for white mold. We started treating it R1. We're gonna treat every couple of weeks, every two to three weeks after that, when we hit R3 and when we hit R5, if we're on a heavy pressure year, like this one is happening to be. So with the fungicide, yeah, we're making regular applications. I am still looking to see if there's some disease out there, but really, I'm not looking because, oh, if I see disease, I'm going to treat. I'm looking to see, hey, how did our treatment plan work so far? Three of the most common diseases are white mold that Darren mentioned, then there's frog eye leaf spot and brown spot. Here's the problem. The strobe products, the strobiliarin products like Headline, Quadris, Avito, they're not good on any of those. With frog eye and with brown spot, we're seeing lots of resistance. With white mold, it's going to take a totally different fungicide to do a very good job. So we would just encourage you, number one, look at multiple modes of action two or preferably even three modes of action out there would be great. You can pick from a strobe. We like having that out there for the plant health benefits, but there are also triazole fungicides and SDHI fungicides. So anymore on our farm, I'm going for at least two modes of action and preferably three just to cover a much broader disease spectrum and reduce the issues I have with resistance. All right, last component here that you may consider throwing in, and I, and I realize there's lots of things you might do out there. You might use some plant growth regulators or plant growth hormones. I look at these natural type products like beneficial microbes as having some potential here too. One thing that we're doing this year, we're trying a product called N-Hydro that's supposed to help the plant produce more nitrogen. So it's a microbe that gets into the plant and brings more nitrogen into the plant. We'll see, we've done some work on it over the last couple of years. Looks kind of promising. We're trying more of that in studies this year. Now, did you notice how Darren said, trying that? So there are a lot of things that are proven. Insecticide's proven, fungicide is proven. But when it comes to some of these different biological or natural products, we just encourage you, try a few acres of that and see whether or not that's going to pay for you on your farm. 
Well, there are a lot of things you may consider doing at this stage in soybeans. It's not too late. Don't give up on your soybeans now. It's way too early to quit working on your soybeans if they're still green and they're still growing and they're still putting on blooms. So we're looking at insects, we're looking at disease protection, we're looking at potentially what we may need for some nutrients, not only this year, but in the future. And then we're also looking at some of the beneficial microbes that may help our crop too. One other thing that we'll be watching for out in our fields is our weed of the week. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed later in the show. There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plan be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. AgroLiquid moves you closer to your target in 1949, Morton Buildings constructed our first machine storage building to establish our bond with the farming community. Since then, our relationship has grown, and so have our product offerings. From the smallest specialized operation to the largest agricultural enterprise, we understand the needs of your business and continue to evolve to meet industry demands. Plus, when you build a Morton building, you're backed by the strongest warranty in the business. To learn more about the Morton Advantage, visit mortonbuildings.com. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yield's what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Farmers across the country have put their confidence in the Roundup Ready Extend crop system. These are their experiences. My satisfaction with Extend the Max on controlling weeds is this is second to none. We had fine results on the weed side and we had excellent results on the yield side. It's taking down the weeds, cleaning the fields up. Our confidence is high. There's no reason not to have Extend the Max on your fields. Put it on challenging acres and they're clean. Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm. Because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future. Brian and I have gotten a chance to travel around quite a bit this year and there are a lot of issues out in fields in 2019. We're going to talk about two specific issues, planter issues and herbicide carryover issues. Yeah, and it's not just the carryover. One of the things that we've seen more of this year is where farmers applied the herbicide at the right rate in the right places and then they had washing. They had so much rain it moved that herbicide to other areas of the field. I saw some white corn where one of the HPPDs had moved down to a low area of the field. Do we normally see this? Absolutely not. Am I worried about this a lot in the future? No way. But because these things happen this year, we have to be thinking about going into next year, boy, if I got a two, three, four X rate of any herbicide out there, will that hurt my crop next year? If it's an HPPD herbicide, I'm absolutely worried about that if I want to rotate to soybeans. So if you had this issue on your farm, what we're going to encourage you to do is consider planting the same crop in there again next year. The other thing I'm concerned about, Brian, is just how late some of the applications are made. We talk about the crop being behind, but because the crop's behind, some of these herbicide applications got pushed much later. And when we're using HPPD products, when we're using Stinger, when we're putting Flexstar. things out there like Flexstar, Fomesifen, that has a 10-month rotational restriction to corn, and guys were putting it on in July, that makes me really nervous because I know a lot of those guys intend to start planting in April or early May. They may have to hold off a little bit on planting next year. That's something that's going to be a big thing in 2020. All right, so carryover is a concern as we head into next year. 
One of the most concerning things this year was all the issues we saw with the planter. Darren, what were the top, let's say, two or three things that you saw for problems? Well, we saw a lot of guys planting into muddy conditions, and I'd say by far and away that was number one. So we had some sidewall smearing issues, and you, you go out and do some digging in these fields. The seed depth was just so erratic that, wow, I, I've looked at fields where the planting depth literally was just below the surface on corn and we've got roots coming out above ground. And then the very next plant, we're three inches deep. It was a mess out there. I will say this, on our planter, I was really happy with the stands that we got and how things functioned. We invested the money to upgrade the row units on our planter. Now with downforce, that's been a huge thing for us. So I, I would say look your planter over really closely and go out in the field also and see, hey, how did my planter perform in some of these conditions? Even where things were good, we had some planter issues out in the field. You wanna change that before next season. But having a good seed bed is so unbelievably important. You've got to do that. And we would just really encourage you, thinking about next year, when you're planting, make sure you are taking the time occasionally to get off the planter, make sure that the depth is right, that the seed spacing is right. Get things set appropriately, and every field, it may change. If you switch to no-till, and then you've got some strip-till, then you've got some conventional till, just like we do, well, you've got to make adjustments to that planter as you go. Well, there's certainly a lot of issues out there in fields in 2019, and the only way you're going to figure it out is not looking above ground, but to do a little digging in your field as well to see what's happening. And then really watch out on these herbicides for potential carryover for next year and injury for this year. Well, the only good thing, Darren, about that carryover is it may wipe out our Weed of the Week. We'll talk about this tough weed coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> is brome grass. Now you might look at brome grass and say, oh, I love having brome grass out there. It's important for my roadside ditch. There are benefits to brome grass, but there are also cases where we absolutely want to control it. Well, anytime you have a weed, Brian, that means it's a plant growing in the wrong place. And if you've got some brome grass creeping out into your field, it is a huge yield driver because it's a perennial with rhizomes. So that extensive root system will pull moisture away really quickly from the outside few rows in your crop. So you want to make sure you keep that brome grass out. So what we used to do is go out there with a moldboard plow and cut the brome grass right on the edges of all our fields. That worked fairly well. If you do just minimum tillage though, you're not going to destroy any brome grass plants because this is a tough perennial that has rhizomes. So you're going to need something that's very effective on it, like Roundup, for example. Now, you can burn this weed down with many different grass herbicides, but again, think about the rhizomes there. How are you going to kill the rhizomes? About the only way I know is with Roundup, and it's going to take a high rate. Yeah, and that's the key here is the rate, because if you're saying, well, I'm spraying a quart to Roundup out here for my weeds, I'm burning back the brome grass a little bit, but it just keeps coming. Yeah, you're going to need the full labeled rate if you're going to try and kill an established perennial weed like brome grass. Well, once again, our Weed of the Week is brome grass. Do everything you can to stop it on your farm where it's not wanted. Again, you could do very deep tillage, or you can certainly go out there with a high rate of Roundup. That's all the time we have for this week's Weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next. Do you feel like there's never enough time to get everything done before planting? The window for spring work is quick and unforgiving. Give yourself the upper hand with the ProTill High Performance High Speed Disc. More and more farmers agree the ProTill is the right tool for spring field conditions and heavy residue management. Zero maintenance bearings, independent disc technology, oversized pins and bushings allow the ProTill to handle whatever field or conditions you can throw at it. Degelman High Performance Equipment. In 1949, 
Morton Buildings constructed our first machine storage building to establish our bond with the farming community. Since then, our relationship has grown and so have our product offerings. From the smallest specialized operation to the largest agricultural enterprise, we understand the needs of your business and continue to evolve to meet industry demands. Plus, when you build a Morton building, you're backed by the strongest warranty in the business. To learn more about the Morton Advantage, visit mortonbuildings.com. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yield's what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Tough, precise, efficient. Strip tillage with the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm. Learn more at soilwarrior.com slash agphd. There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plant be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. AgroLiquid moves you closer to your target. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. With the success of the Case IH Diger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. There's an expectation of higher corn prices and more corn acres going into 2020. In the past, that's translated to higher fertilizer prices. To beat that and to buy when prices are low, you'll need fertilizer storage on the farm. Even if prices don't go up, having a product when and where you need it through the planting season is a must. Liquid fertilizer storage is the topic of today's Iron Talk. If you handle any amount of liquid fertilizer at planting time, side dress time, or just at any point during the growing season, you've learned two things. First, everyone else wants product about the same exact time that you do, and it's often tough to get exactly what you want when you want it. And second, dealers are loading up on product in the off-season because they can buy it cheaper, yet they charge you a much higher price per gallon in-season. Here are a few ideas of how you may equip your farm to lower your fertilizer costs and reduce the hassle when you need it. When it comes to fertilizer tanks, getting a strong and sturdy tank should go without saying. Next, have separate tanks for each product so you can store them without worrying about settling out and also giving you the flexibility to change your blend next spring. Then, be sure to have adequate storage. Have enough tanks so you can handle a full load, plus have some room to go. For example, liquid 28% nitrogen doesn't freeze, but many starter blends can freeze. If you have heated or indoor storage, it certainly gives you flexibility on which products you can take and when. Finally, if your tanks happen to be outside, and really if they're inside too, chemical and UV resistance prevents algae growth in the tank and prevents chemical degradation of the fertilizer by tank-borne contaminants like rust. A proper liquid fertilizer handling system can save you time and money. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but if you're looking for more agronomic information, we'd encourage you to check out the Ag PhD radio show. We're on each weekday on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central. Don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.